This is a friendly reminder that we'll be recording tonight's session and it will be uploaded to the UC Merced Community Engagement Center's YouTube channel tomorrow. Good evening and thank you all for joining us for episode six of our series of candidate conversations leading up to the 2020 general election on November 3rd. Tonight's event is honored to be hosted by the UC Merced Community Engagement Center and the Office of Government and Community Relations. My name is Lizeth, my pronouns are they and them, and I'm a fifth year student majoring in political science and sociology at UC Merced. I'm excited to be moderating tonight's discussion. During this series, as we sit behind our computer screens, hearing from the candidates that hope to help build our community's future, it's clear that we are in unprecedented times. Due to the pandemic, we can't gather to engage in healthy debate and discussion like we normally would. So we felt it was important to find a way for members of our community at UC Merced, including students, faculty, and staff, to engage with the candidates running to represent them. This virtual format allows the UC Merced community to invite our friends and neighbors to join us in the discussion from the comfort of home. So welcome to all, and please be sure to let your local family, friends, and neighbors know they are welcome to join us for upcoming sessions if they miss this one. Additionally, if you are eligible to vote, please be sure to remember to register or make sure you're already registered by visiting registertovote.ca.gov. Before we get started, let us pause and acknowledge all local indigenous peoples. Merced resides on Yoku and Miwok land. We acknowledge the Yoku and Miwok, the native inhabitants of this land. We embrace and respect Yoku and Miwok's continued connection to this region. Thank you for protecting and nurturing this land. Let us continuously acknowledge we live, work, learn, and collaborate on Yoku and Miwok traditional homeland. We will now take a moment of gratitude to pay respects to Yoku and Miwok elders and to all Yoku and Miwok people. Thank you. Now let me go over a few housekeeping items. All participants are muted upon entry. We encourage you to use the speaker view instead of gallery view. We will start with some pre-selected questions for the candidate. Participants can type questions into the chat and we will get to as many as we can during our time. If you would like to ask your question live, please use the raise hand function or let us know in the chat and we will unmute you to do so. Again, we will get to as many questions as we can during our allotted time. Reminder that this is meant to be a conversation and opportunity to get to know the candidates, so please keep it respectful and on topic. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Tonight, we have the opportunity to hear from Lee Lohr, candidate for Merced County Board of Supervisors, District 2. Ms. Lohr, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll go ahead and get started with a basic question. Tell, you, tell us a little about yourself and why you decided to run for re-election. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for joining us um, during this conversation. My name is Lee Lohr and I'm running for re-election, Merced County Supervisor representing District 2, which includes the University of California, Merced. Um, I wanted to start off a little bit about my background because folks um, folks don't folks may not be familiar. Um, and with my paid experience prior to elected office, um, it was an education around community and public relations community partnerships and development, including programming and fund development. My volunteer experience prior to elected office was supporting local nonprofit organizations in our community through development, which included building capacity in people and in systems. I ran for county supervisor the first time because people deserved to be treated fairly and equitably with the opportunities made available by the county um, and especially by my county supervisor at the time. While in office, I worked with residents, including a couple of professors at UC Merced, to create an interactive children's museum that will employ students, keep our talent, attract new talent, and increase our quality of life. I'm running for re-election because I need to make sure that the programs and the initiatives we put in place are sustainable. And in my next term, I will focus on paid opportunities for young people. We know that that is a great need here in Merced and Merced County. Thank you so much for that response. Um, our next question is, what are the top three issues you hope to address as member of the Merced County Board of Supervisors if re-elected? That's always a tough question because um, as a county supervisor, we our main role is creating policy and um, ensuring that our 
policies in place are uh, efficient, effective, and equitable for our community. And so folks, those are less tangible and folks don't, don't really see that. Um, what I've been doing um, above and beyond the traditional responsibilities of a county supervisor is being more involved and more engaged in our community. And in my mind, um, my focus um, falls all under economic development. Now, when folks uh, talk and think about economic development, they think about bringing in new businesses or bringing in jobs. Um, I like to focus on the other pieces of economic development, and that's the people side. Um, I like to develop people, so build capacity in people to increase their earning potential. And when we increase the quality of skills, we, in, we increase uh, people's ability to earn. And then that then brings in the businesses, the new businesses, right? The higher end stuff, um, the new stuff and new jobs, higher paying jobs. So when people are able to earn more, then that means um, uh, businesses can charge more. And so that elevates our, um, our community and our socioeconomic status throughout Merced and Merced County. So my focus is um, fall under economic development and that's one building people. And then two, our homelessness issue. Um, that we know is a long-term uh, multi-generational solution. And so we need to continue at it. And then um, I, I want to focus more on issues that impact young people. Now we talk about young people as our tomorrow, as our future, but we also need to focus on them today. Um, we need to build them today for tomorrow. Um, and in doing that, I hired two students, um, Coincidentally, one is a graduate of UC Merced and one is a current student at UC Merced. Um, I didn't get um, qualified applicants from um, other colleges, um, but building that foundation, my goal is to increase the number of paid opportunities, especially paid student intern opportunities. And I'm the first county, Merced County supervisor that, that I know of, and I verified it with staff, to hire paid student interns. Now we've had volunteer student interns before, but I was a student before. I know how, how hard it is to, uh, to be in, in college and to have a full-time job and then be a full-time mom. And so it's, it's, um, it's a challenge and your time and your knowledge is really important. It's really valuable. And so as the, the first Mercy County supervisor to hire paid student interns, that's, that's just the first step. And so um, the top three under economic development is uh, building people, our homelessness issue, and then um, issues around uh, young people. Okay, thank you so much for that response. And um, you mentioned the um, your role within policy and Merced policy. Um, would you say that there's a disconnect with how involved um, residents are in policy creation? And if so, um, what do you think are some steps we can take to kind of bridge that gap? Yes, there is a total disconnect. Um, because of the government system, when folks talk about transparency and when they talk about communication, um, they're unclear as to what kind of transparency and what kind of communication. So when, when um, decision makers or when elected officials run for office and they say, I wanna increase communication, it doesn't mean the methods of communication and the volume of communication, what residents need is the interpretation and the translation of those communications. And that's what I found um, going into elected office and being in elected office. It's not necessarily the um, how we get the message out, but it's how residents understand and react and respond um, and engage with those um, communications. Same with transparency. We can increase the way um, and how we do business, but if our residents don't understand it, then they will continue saying you lack transparency. And so that's what um, decision makers and elected officials need to focus on. And that's exactly how we will get engagement in our community. Um, and I was able to do that through the people's budget I used District 2's discretionary funds to increase our residents' engagement. And we did exactly that. We broke down the process for them and we um, interpreted 
um, county, county policies as well as demonstrated. And so we walked them through the, the process of um, gathering ideas from the residents, um, creating proposals that they could then submit to the Board of Supervisors, and then getting residents to vote on the most, um, on the project that they feel would most benefit their community. And then the Board of Supervisors approved it, and then residents helped me implement whatever program they voted for. And so that helped them experience the process of, um, of, go of government, of county um, budget, of the county budget process. And then it, um, it walked them through. And so they were more engaged, they were less fearful of decision makers and the government system. And so when we um, talk about increasing resident engagement, that's what we need to focus on is the interpretation and, um, and demonstrating um, the transparency as well as the communication, not just increasing um, the, the avenues or how we communicate. Definitely, definitely. I think the, the way that our communities receive information um, and are able to understand it is, is very important. And you mentioned something else about um, unpaid internships. And I know I can relate if there's a couple of other students on our call, maybe they can relate. And it's, it's definitely um, something that at, at UC Merced, as students, it's impacted us in the way that we, the types of um, jobs or experience we're able to get and then how we're able to sustain ourselves with that. So I thank you so much for that. Um, and we can go ahead and move on to our next question. Um, the Merced County budget is a fiscal operational and staffing plan for the provision of services to the residents of Merced County. The budget is developed and prepared based on the goals and priorities set forth by Merced County Board of Supervisors. If you elected as supervisors or as supervisor, are there specific areas in which you would like to see the board focus the budget on? And you did talk a little bit about the people's budget, um, but if there are other areas that, that you would like to see the board focus the budget on. Um, traditionally, the board has focused on um, more tangible things um, like roads, infrastructure, um, public safety. What I would like the county to focus more on are the health and human services. And traditionally, it has been health and human services, you know, they operate on their own. They receive funding from the state and federal government. And with that funding comes um, strings that we must um, work with and we must work around. And so traditionally uh, decision makers and elected officials kind of shy away from that because it's less tangible. Um, the perception is that it comes with guidelines, um, but working in education and working with um, our local nonprofit organizations, there's always ways to compromise and there's always ways um, to work around those guidelines. And in the last you know, five, six years, the state has been more flexible and um, open to changing their guidelines and their requirements. And so we need, as a county, we need to focus on more health and human services because as a, as a person, if you are well and you have the skills, then the jobs will come. And so we need to focus on the quality of our people and our skills in order to bring those new businesses, attract those new businesses and create those new jobs. And we saw it with, with organizations like UC Merced and um, Waymo, you bring in a great institution and for many, many years, they bring in people from outside Merced and Merced County. And so we need to, um, we need to hire more local folks. And, and it's not, um, it's not a criticism of UC Merced, it's the way things are, right? They come here, um, they wanna hire our local people, but they don't qualify. And so we need to focus on our people in order to attract and keep um, organizations like UC Merced, like Waymo, like all these other uh, tech companies that we want to attract. Definitely, I think on, on that topic, I think the conversation within UC Merced students is that aspect of the folks that um, want to stay in the Central Valley. Like I moved here from Sacramento and I definitely consider and want to stay in the Central Valley for the many reasons that, that you mentioned. I think, I think there's a lot of folks that would love to stay here and build with the city and grow with the city. And I think 
there's there's a great opportunity to bridge those both both efforts um, and and push together towards towards that aspect that we would like to see of Merced. Um, you mentioned the health. Um, it was the health and human services aspect, and I I believe the health goes into our next question. Um, so for decades, Merced County has struggled to convince doctors to come to Merced County to live and practice here, which goes into you talking about, um, you know, the, the talent and, and having folks from Merced maybe that could fill these positions. Um, but as a result, a recent study by the Merced County Public Health Department showed that for every 100,000 Merced County residents, there are 45 doctors, which is below the national average. And the national average is for every 100,000 residents, there are 77 doctors. So that's about, I'm gonna do quick math here, 30, 30 doctors or so less than the national average. This makes Merced County residents more vulnerable to preventable illnesses, specifically the residents that don't have the means to travel to a different county to get medical services. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly highlighted to us just how important access to healthcare is. If re-elected as supervisor, how would you make sure that the county works towards closing this accessibility to healthcare gap? I sat on the hospital board, the Mercy Hospital Board for many years. And I also um, sat on the community advisory board of the hospital. I also chaired um, that board of the committee. And I know the challenges. Um, I hear from doctors, I hear from recruiters, I hear from residents about the need for more doctors to stay in Merced and Merced County and the quality of care um, in Merced County. And so that's uh, definitely been one of the focuses, though it may not be the main and public um, focus. Uh, part of the solution, uh, part of my solution is um, the Children's Museum. It will um, it will help support multi multiple sectors. Um, we have a representative from the hospital who sit on our uh, museum board. And so we get feedback from her too and, and how we can keep our doctors. So for, uh, for a while, and, and even today, I believe, the hospital is a training ground for, uh, for doctors. So they'll come here, they'll get their training. And when a better opportunity arises, they, they leave. And so we have a problem retaining um, our doctors because of that, uh, because of um, the, the lack of opportunities for doctors outside of their day-to-day -day, uh, employment. And so um, in working with the county, we have been supporting the hospital um, to do that in terms of um, economic development, advertising, uh, supporting, um, contracting with the, with the hospital to provide healthcare services to uh, residents. And so there are multiple and multi-generational solutions that have to be in place to make sure that, um, that our community can sustain all, these, all this talent that comes to Merced. And I want folks like you to stay in Merced because we need people to come together and develop Merced and Merced County in a way that our residents want. So there isn't, um, there isn't really a direct solution that can be implemented right away. I also sit on the um, Alliance Board, so the Central California Alliance for Health. And through that, we provide grants for doctors to, um, to supplement their, their reimbursement rate. So if they see Medi-Cal patients, they get reimbursed from the state and the federal government at a lower level. And so with the Alliance, we then provide additional funding to the doctors to increase their um, the amount they get paid for their services. And so that kind of helps um, keep some doctors here. Um, there are other, there are other um, issues that we can't uh, directly address right now. So I've heard from several doctors that um, they're single, they come, they get their training, they want to stay here. But uh, the quality of fish in the sea isn't what they're looking for. And so they have to move to bigger areas to, to find the kind of fish that they want, right? So, um, so it's a work in progress. There are multiple avenues we um, are taking and can take to ensure that um, quality professionals like doctors um, stay in our community. 
Yeah, definitely. I think I think you bring up a great point of sustainable long term practices and how to best um, provide that when we are up against the generational, just generational things that we have to address. Um, I, I know I was just thinking, um, I'm thinking about the um, announcement of the medical, I believe it's medical center or medical school um, in the Central Valley with the UC Merced, um, well, coming from UC Merced, what, um, how do you envision maybe like working together with this center to maybe provide maybe those resources? Do you think that would be possible? Definitely possible. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity that's, uh, that's coming and we wanna make sure that it happens. We wanna make sure that it stays. Um, but we also need to focus on what goes on around the center uh, the quality of life issues, the quality of the opportunities around here. If we don't focus on that, then we will continue to be that training ground. People will come to the medical school, they'll get training for several years, and then they leave, right? So we, in, in addition to making sure that the, the school and the training happens here, we need to make sure that the retention piece um, is implemented at the same time as well. All right, thank you so much. And I did just notice in the chat that Priya has um, their hand up. Priya, would you like to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, Lee, hope you're doing Hi. well. Um, my quick question to you, you were just talking about, you know, healthcare and how we can uh, attract more physicians. And to be very honest, I, I think that having a children's museum is not gonna solve the problem. I think the, the problem that, uh, that I encounter when I, cause I talked, my husband's a physician. So I know the, the, the difficulty we have in recruiting physicians here. And to have young families here, the question always goes back to the school district. They look at the scores and they don't wanna live here. Even if they have a job here, I mean, same goes with the professors at the UC. They, most of them live here, but some of them choose not to live here because of the schools or because of the homes or other situations. My question to you is what effort you as a board, not only you as an individual member, but the board of supervisors are doing to engage with the school district? Because we all don't, we all operate in silos in Merced, I think. So what is this, the board of supervisors or you would do to build partnership with the Merced City School District, the city and the Merced County Office of Education to improve our schools, to improve our achievement. Um, and yeah, just overall student success. Cause I think if you don't have good educational institutions it's going to be extremely difficult to bring talent whether it's physicians or others. Yes, definitely. Um, so the Children's Museum is part of the solution. Um, with my experience in education, we were able to navigate um, the educational system through the County Office of Ed a little bit easier. Um, so the county has been present in um, the all district superintendents meetings, um, not regularly, um, but when we need to involve the schools, we have been um, in direct communication with district superintendents. My husband works for the city school district. I am um, supported by the uh, classified union of the Merced uh, city school district. Um, the, there's, um, I'm supporting a candidate that's running for uh, uh, district, uh, Merced City School District Board. Um, and my students, my, my children go um, to schools in the city of Merced. And so my involvement personally has been through um, school site councils, uh, previously also with ELAC and DLAC, if you're familiar. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm really involved. My um, message in my first uh, campaign was so education focused that I had critics telling me, I sound like I, I'm running for a school board versus county supervisor. And so um, I've lessened my public message on that, but the effort is still happening to ensure that our um, local government and our school districts are in tune with each other because the school district is uh, the beginning, um, the economic development and the government system and um, higher institutions are the next step for our um, for our students. So it's definitely happening. It's just not as public uh, because folks are um, a little critical about my focus on education. Yeah, not 
yes, education. I, yes, I, I know and all your efforts, I appreciate your efforts and I hope you can get others to get on board with you and improve our school systems. My other question about recruitment is also, you know, all the homeless, you, you've already touched on the homeless problems, but seriously, when you are trying to tour, give tours of our city and there's just a lot of vacancy and, and how dirty our city is. And I, and I, and I love Merced and I'm not trying to say insult Merced in any way, but th these are the problems we have to recognize. You go to a nice neighborhood, then there's like only two or three pockets of neighborhood we can really take professionals who are trying to buy homes. So what are you doing working in conjunction with the city to improve just even cleaning up? I understand like cleaning up Merced, you know, let's all gather and clean up Tuesday and those are all great, but I don't think it's up to individuals to do that. I think it's the government's responsibility. We all pay taxes and I'm not trying to be critical of you or anything. I'm just asking you and the board, what are you all doing to improve just the cleanliness instead of depending on its citizens, but you as the government agents what are you doing to help the situation or improve the situation? It takes it takes all of us, government and residents. And I say that because um, we need the residents to um, we need the residents to support um, what the county is doing or what government is doing. So when I came on board and I started addressing the homeless issue, um, I had fingers pointing like this. Um, and so we were able to get the cities and the county in, involved in creating a task force to address homelessness. We just approved uh, $5 million over three years for um, the rescue mission to directly um, address and increase their, their um, efforts around homelessness. Uh, you hear about the navigation center that is opening. Um, we just, the county just created um, a, little like a a section um, with a director and with staff focused directly on homelessness and housing um, and we've never had that before so we'll have staff um, county staff um, dedicated to that um, the when I when I came in um, my thing is let's beautify Merced and Merced County um, we started with uh, the county administration building um, and in addition to working through the county system, I'm working with some residents, um, two separate resident, group, resident groups. One is um, South Merced, and then the other is um, mainly Central and North Merced. And what those residents are doing is they're going into um, these encampments safely and building relationships with folks who are experiencing homelessness and um, getting them um, connected to resources. Now, as a county agency, uh, we have no um, we have no authority to arrest folks if they're on public property, and. Um, you'll see a lot of um, encampments around the, um, the freeway on ramps and off ramps. And that is state property. And so we are working with the state to make sure that the state is backing us up in um, cleaning up those areas. So it does take both residents and the county to make sure that it works. Um, and the example is, um, Several years ago, the rescue mission came out with um, a hand up, a hand, a hand up, not a handout, um, and and they were handing out little cards that uh, that educated residents. If there's a panhandler, if there's a homeless person that you encounter, you know, don't give them money, don't give them food, give them resources. If they if they want water, they want food right away. You know, it's okay, but don't make a don't make it a practice. And so, if we um, direct folks to a central location or central resources, then we won't have the, uh, the panhandlers. So we need residents to support what the county is doing um, and to be more informed about the impact that they make when they give out money or when they give out food on a regular basis. So it's not an immediate solution and you won't see immediate results because we can, we can um, ask them to move nicely today and they'll be back tomorrow. And so it's, it is an ongoing, but we are putting in more county dollars to homelessness than we have ever before. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate it. I appreciate your answers. 
Thank you, Priya, for your question. And yeah, thank you, um, Ms. Lor, for your response and that. I, I know our um, participants can really appreciate that and your perspective on it. Um, I have a follow-up question on that. Would you, um, do you see something similar to Measure V where um, voters approved a half cent, um, half cent sales tax in specifically for um, fixing and improving roads? Would you see something like that um, that could be similar, maybe arise out of um, the need to sustain and provide resources to our homeless population happen in Merced? If it is the will of the voters, it can happen. Um, we need to be real strategic about our plans and how we assist folks because we have a wide range of, of folks. We have folks who are um, at, at, uh, at risk of being, homelessness, uh, of being homeless. We have folks who, um, who choose to be homeless. We have folks who are um, not uh, capable to make their own decisions. Um, thus being homeless. And so there's a wide variety. We need to ensure that the plans we have in place for voters to vote on um, is effective for our community. So with the will of the voters, it can happen. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for our next question, and this goes back to um, our topic um, relating to COVID-19. Multiple studies have shown that this current pandemic has caused an increase of individuals that report to have symptoms of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. Mental illness is often considered a taboo topic in some communities, but we're finding that the stigma is being broken. Do you believe that Merced County is doing enough to address mental illness? And what do you hope to see the Board of Supervisors do differently when it comes to mental illness? The board has the board and the county has not um, adequately addressed uh, um, mental health issues. Um, part of what I have done is um, build capacity, and so I sit on the Behavioral Health Advisory Board as the um, Board of Supervisors representative, and um, I've been successful with that board to really focus um, their efforts. So when I came on in 2017, um, the Behavioral Health Board was, they had no direction. And so I implemented with their help um, an annual process where they established goals, they established a plan, and then they evaluated, they self-evaluated. And if, they were, if we were successful in those goals, then we would create new ones. The ones that we were uh, still working on, we would keep on our to-do list. And so that has really been effective to, um, to demonstrate the need in our, in our county and to articulate the need in our county. And so when folks talk about the need for more resources, especially around mental health illnesses, um, that's, that's all we say. And, and we need to be more, um, more defined in our ask. And with that process, the Behavioral Health Board was able to identify specific needs in the community that, um, that the Behavioral Health Board, the Behavioral Health Department, and the county um, needed to focus on. And so with that um, board in place, we were able to then look at um, our, how the county is providing services. And now what we're looking at is services, mental health services through the eyes of the consumer. And so we can address quality um, as well as services, as well as programming, as well as funding um, through that channel. Um, we can also um, address the need through our local nonprofit organizations. Um, and that has been my push for the last um, two, three years is build capacity. We can build capacity in, in individuals, we can build capacity in nonprofit organizations. So when, um, so when I came on board, that was my push is the county has the authority and we are in the position to build the capacity of local nonprofit organizations. Now it doesn't have to be 100% building capacity like us dedicating a staff member to a nonprofit organization and helping them get established. But when we have um, partnership opportunities, we work with nonprofit organizations so that they can then get their ducks in a row to take advantage of um, an opportunity provided by the county or the state or the federal government. And so where that has been successful is 
um, if you're familiar with the continuum of care, uh, United Way was the collaborative applicant and United Way could no longer serve in that role. So I advocated for the county to take that position and to build the capacity of two, at least two nonprofit organizations who would then eventually have that opportunity to take over as the collaborative applicant. It has been successful so far. Um, we have changed a little bit in, in our goal. We haven't built the capacity in nonprofit organizations like we, um, like we need to, um, but it is a good position for the county to be in to serve as a collaborative applicant. And so um, my big thing is when you build the capacity of people and the capacity of systems, then things flow a little bit easier. And that's just the first, um, that's just the first part of a big solution. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I was thinking a lot about um, what, how similar it seems um, as an incoming student at UC Merced and the need for capacity um, with mental health services on campus and how similar it, it, it is in, in the city. Um, we have a lot of students that due to the capacity of um, our on campus, it's our CAPS department, um, due to the capacity of that and maybe like the long-term way, some students look into the city, but the resources, um, it, it's also very minimal, the ones that they find. So we have folks that look at, um, at other cities around Merced. So I, I definitely see where um, the need for that capacity is. And I, um, I appreciate definitely the perspective of the county being the one that is also then the one helping the nonprofits. Um, I think that that also goes into like a sustainable way to maintain it for longer, at least knowing that the city is able to be there um, long term. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, on the same topic of, um, of COVID-19, but now looking at pre-COVID-19, we would have been at UC Merced having this conversation in person. Um, many members of our audience would have had to drive through Lake Road or Bellevue Road to arrive to campus. And the evening drive would reveal very dim lighting, cars um, maybe driving at a speed dangerous for bicyclists, very narrow bike lanes and potholes that would definitely rattle the driver. Um, and if reelected as supervisor for District 2, how would you address the need for improvement for roads like Bellevue and Lake to make them safe? Um, and how would you highlight the needs of the District 2 bicyclists? So I'm gonna fall back on the, on the building capacity piece and how decisions are made. Um, when, when I came on board, I um, recruited folks and um, I helped them through the process of how um, local agencies make decisions. And I do that because um, elected officials change, but residents stay the same and, and community initiatives stay the same. So if I can show people how to navigate the system um, in a safe way um, and in a successful way, I will do that. Because um, if, if residents continue to rely on their elected official, um, when a new person comes in, then they have to start all over and they have to advocate that elected official all over. But if I can show residents how the, uh, the process works and how decisions are made, because residents and voters are the bosses. And so they are the ones who, um, who provide direction to their elected official. So if those residents can, can um, build a plan and work with that plan, regardless of who comes into office, they will be successful a lot faster. And so one, building capacity within our residents to navigate the system. Um, and then two, there's, there's multiple things going on at the same time when it comes to that area. We all know Campus Parkway is coming in. We all know um, the Outwater Merced Expressway is coming in. And so um, the, the challenge is um, what to address first. And if we address uh, something, um, let's say we address um, Lake Road or we address um, bike paths, uh, right now, in like five years, there's going to be new bike paths. So are we efficiently using taxpayers dollars? Um, and so that's a decision that elected officials and residents need to make. And so when residents make that decision, they need to, uh, to um, follow that uh, plan and the, uh, the process to ensure that they're um, 
that their wishes and their needs are heard. So um, for me, that's the most powerful thing is, is residents and their voices. Um, when it comes to the roads specifically, I always get requests from residents to focus on their particular road. Um, and it's a challenge to help them understand that, yes, your road is important, and there's other roads in the county or in the city that also need attention. And so folks should realize that their street might be bad, but there are worse roads in, in, their, in the neighboring community or, or the neighboring um, streets. And so there, it's a fine balance, um, but with Measure V, um, local roads and regional roads have um, have been the focus. And so if folks are interested in um, fixing roads, definitely connect with me and I can help you uh, with the process. Because again, you want to make sure that your goals are met regardless of who's in office. Definitely. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and share with folks if y'all are interested, definitely reach out. Um, I have a quick follow-up question on that. You mentioned the um, residents making their their needs um, heard or voicing their concerns. What have been, um, I, I know from the time I've been here at Merced, I've usually seen folks gather or rally to do the public, um, public comment portion at either city council or district of supervisor meetings. Um, is, are, is what has been maybe the most effective way or maybe ways that you see that are effective where residents when they um, want to engage um, maybe where they can start or um, maybe some effective ways that you've seen during your time? Um, effective ways are always, for me, it's always been um, nonprofit organizations or local initiatives because um, naturally people will go first to folks they trust. And um, when you work through a nonprofit organization and it, it depends too on what your goals are, right? Um, when you go through a nonprofit organization or you go through a community initiative, you already have folks um, centered around an issue. Um, when it comes from the government, um, from the government side, it's always best for the decision makers to go into the community. So versus saying we have public comment at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays at this location, we need to open it up and say, I will be in this location in your neighborhood at this time in this way. Um, and we should have implemented um, emails and phone calls and uh, virtual uh, opportunities to participate in our meetings prior to COVID. Like we didn't need COVID to prove to us that we could engage via Zoom, via phone call, via text. Um, so government systems definitely need to um, adapt with the changes, with the times. Yes, yes, I do. I do agree. One thing that maybe we, we've been able to, I've, at least I can relate to that I've been able to understand, maybe see more so is that you know, connecting in, in the way that we are now and across cities, across towns and states, this can definitely continue and be used as a way to continue to engage and bring maybe even the information to folks. But definitely, I think when you bring, um, when you bring those resources to communities and show them that there is access beyond having to be somewhere at a certain time, I, I definitely agree. Thank you so much for that. Um, and our last question is, before we open it um, up again for Q&A, um, actually it's all open, send it in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. Um, but our last question is, one common concern in the community um, is about the lack of coordination between the county officials and the city officials. Do you think that concern is fair? And if so, what would you do as a county board of supervisor to merge that supposed disconnect? Um. I can, I can say that it varies with elected official, uh, with, with each elected official. Um, and I can tell you that it's, it's a polit political play. Um, I've had great working relationships with some um, city officials, uh, some city electeds, and I've had um, no uh, working relationships with some um, officials. And for me, I work with anybody and everybody, when 
uh, when there is no relationship, it's oftentimes the other party who chooses not to have um, a working relationship or a relationship period. Um, as the only uh, woman on the Board of Supervisors, I am excluded from a lot of conversations and a lot of activities, and, and that's expected, right? But I find ways to work around that, and it may not be um, publicly seen, where it might not be seen um, by the public, and it might not be obvious. Um, but there's uh, there's always uh, politics in play, uh, public politics in play, and um, it's it's all about uh, traditionally it's all about throwing dirt at each other, and and that's not me. Um, and you'll see that um, I choose to step back when uh, folks have an argument because I know that there's always a way around it and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, folks are conditioned to see uh, politics in play uh, through the media um, and through, through what they've seen locally. And so that's what uh, voters tend to judge um, candidates on is how they act or how they're not acting to what voters are familiar with. And so I've had great working relationships with some city elected officials um, I've had none um, with some, and, and there's always a story behind that. And so I encourage folks to really, um, really ask and really do their homework on the, um, on the results and the actions, the characters of, of who they're considering for, um, for office, because what they see in the media and what they hear might not necessarily be true. Um, so it, it's all in the results and the actions that um, folks take. And so we as a society, as a community, really need to work on um, increasing our skills around, um, around um, reading folks and interpreting um, actions and interpreting um, the language that we use. And, and I'm really... Um, I, I try to be as intentional with, with my choice of words as possible. And so when, um, when, folks, um, when folks hear and, and not really analyze the words that I use, then they assume something, but um, they assume something else. But um, they're just, just be aware of the politics that are, that are in play. Yeah, thank you so much for your, your um, response to that and for sharing with us a little bit about your experience. Um, I do want to take some time um, and allow for space if anybody wants to raise their hands and ask a question um, or send it into the chat at this point. Um, I'm not sure maybe if folks are able to unmute themselves um, or just raise your hand and we'll go ahead and unmute you if you have a question now. Um, We'll give some time for that, but I, I do have a quick follow up question. You know, you mentioned something very real to um, to a lot of folks, a lot of folks that I've encountered in the city at the UC um, and to myself personally about being maybe like a woman um, or non binary folk. Um, I myself am non binary, so I'll say women and non binary folk um, in spaces where sometimes we're challenged um, or there is we're the only woman or um, LGBTQ folk in the space, um, what is some advice that you would have for folks that maybe encounter themselves in those situations? Um, and maybe some advice that has been helpful for you as the only woman on the board of supervisors. It is human nature to react and not respond. Um, so when you're being treated that way, your, your instinct is to be really upset or to be sad or um, or have some sort of emotional uh, reaction to that. Um, learn how to learn how to manage your emotions and to see um, to see the brighter side. And it's always um, a challenge. It, it'll be difficult to see the the more positive side. Um, but when you know you when you know you're right, um, you keep doing you, you keep doing what is right. Um, as long as you're respectful to others, you just keep keep at it. And what speaks louder, we all know what speaks louder than, than words is your action, are your actions. And so when you, um, when you're in a situation and you're 
you don't verbally respond, show them that you're right. Prove to them through your actions that they were wrong. Um, we know that um, the traditional um, culture is that you have to be uh, verbal, you have to be confrontational, you have to be loud, um, and you have to be right, and you have to be heard. Uh, but in some situations, that's, that's not the case. When you're working with people and when you're um, trying to solve social challenges, social issues, it's not about who's the loudest, it's not about who's seen, it's not about who's heard. When we look at decision makers and we look at um, top management, who's, who's with them, who's behind them, who's next to them? You have assistants, you have advisors, you have um, department folks, you have all these people who feed um, information and who feed support to that one person who might be the the most vocal or who might who might be the um, representative, and so don't discount all the people around um, that person who's really loud, and so it, it'll take time, it'll take practice, but learn how to manage your emotions, learn how to respond and 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 react less, and then just keep keep doing what you're doing because you know that it's right um, and you will prove them wrong through your actions. Definitely. I, I really appreciate your words and um, your advice on that aspect. Um, before we end the conversation, um, and folks, you can always send in questions or go ahead and raise your hand. Um, we'd like to give the candidate a minute or so for any closing remarks. Thank you again, everyone, for having me. Um, just to follow up on, on the last comment, um, don't think about what other people think about you and, and how they are going to judge you. Um, oftentimes we're our own worst enemy. And so um, we, may, we may lose, we may lose in that instant, but that's just one of the battles, right? Our goal is to win the war. And so if we know that um, what we're doing is right and we know what, what our goal is, just continue, just keep at it. Um, I wanna make sure that folks have the, the same um, opportunity and the same development opportunities that other folks have. Um, and, and maybe um, we need to reevaluate how we're going to do it, but um, what we're going to do and the goal is still gonna remain the same. So just just remember that. Um, I want to uh, remind folks that um, as we consider our candidates, think about the traditional tangibles that we know and that we're familiar with. So it comes to roads, homelessness, um, the amount of dollars, the amount of businesses that we bring into the community. And then also think about um, the less tangible side um, what we're doing um, on that side and the long term to ensure that our community um, is sustainable and that our community stays. Um, we don't want to be the training ground for folks. Uh, we want to be the destination for forever. We've been the gateway to Yosemite. It's now time to shift and become the destination that we, um, that we were meant to be. And so as folks um, consider their candidates, please consider that. And please also consider the non-traditional ways in which folks are solving issues. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, or want to talk more about some of the things I'm doing, um, please look me up, leelordistrict2.com, or just call me, message me, 209-761-6679. I only have one cell phone, um, and you can get uh, directly to me. Um, I'm looking forward to serving another term. And if... Um, if the stars have it that I am not in office for another term, that's okay because the work will continue. It doesn't matter how, um, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter for me how, and it doesn't really matter uh, what position I hold. What matters to me is that the work will continue with the support of our residents and that we will eventually achieve that. Um, it'll be helpful to be reelected because that'll be the faster path. If not reelected, that'll be the slower path. And so I'm really looking forward to serving another term and I hope that you all will make it happen. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if maybe someone had a question. Let me know. Okay. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Lidor, for, for joining us and for participating uh, um, with us today and letting us get to know you a little bit better, definitely. Um, to, all our part, uh, to all our participants, please make sure you're registered to vote by visiting registertovote.ca.gov. And we would like to welcome you all to join us for our upcoming candidate conversations. Our next one is tomorrow, October 7th with congressional candidate, Kevin Cookingham. Um, you can visit events.ucmerced.edu for future dates and candidates, as well as links, um, but it'll be the same one. And thank you all once again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great evening. Um, thank you all.